Welcome to Pig Pods. We give you actionable insight and stories behind real life success wherever you go. Here are your hosts, Angelos and Mo. Hello, everyone. Hello. This is Angelos and Mo. How's it going, Mo? It's going really well, Angelos, and I'm really happy that we're in our brand new recording studio. Indeed, it is pretty nice. And for those of you who can't see, <laughs> please go on to our YouTube Subscribe channel. Subscribe on YouTube. Yep, and you will find us there. Yep. Cool. Brilliant. So today's podcast is about social me up, please, and how businesses aren't necessarily taking advantage or maybe even realise how good social media can be for their business. I love social media. I know. It is pretty damn good. Do you see all my posts? Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> <laughs> have you unfollowed me yet? And, and banned and blocked, but that's that's another discussion. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just I I just love it. It's so good. I just love the reach. Yeah. I think that's well. I mean, we'll come on to it, but like it's just so powerful. And I think, like you said, a lot of people aren't taking advantage of it, and a lot of people doing a lot of amazing things in business, in their personal life, for other people, charity work, everything, and just not shouting about it. Yeah. And. I just don't know why 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 you wouldn't. I think there's almost um, some businesses get it. Yeah. Because they do so well in their personal life, they upload every single second of their life when they're on the toilet, when they're shaking their legs, it's all documented and there's no problem at all. You saw my post this morning. Yeah, unfortunately I did. You've got <laughs> lovely silky smooth legs. Is it Venus, is it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there are some businesses which are a little bit skeptical, or maybe they don't know, or perhaps there's no one in their um, particular business that actually understands social media. So, with that in mind, are there any businesses that maybe don't need social media? Very good question, Mo. Well, I was, I was thinking about this earlier, and um, the mining industry came to mind. The mining industry. But then mm. I, I thought to myself, they're still going to need to advertise, aren't they? They're still going to need to appeal to people to come and... Um, and work for them. Yeah, so for jobs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So perhaps anything to do with recruitment, social media could help make a good yeah, 100%. Um, good image for a uh, company. The only one that I could think of which wouldn't necessarily scream about what they do could be um, MI6 mm, or yeah. the N- NSA. I, yeah. I can't imagine James Bond's going to be tweeting who he's killed lately. No, no. Um, not necessarily very good for his profile no. as such. But then again, you look at the MI6 and even they understand the importance of... Yeah. Um, getting the, and, their image out and what they do. And probably still from like a PR point of view in terms of like what they're doing, what money's being spent on recruiting as well as we discussed before, I think there's still an element there. Even to like the weirdest, you know, kind of roles would still, yeah, weirdest kind of businesses would still require it. I mean, MI6 has really opened up. I mean, obviously they're not going to be telling us about everything. Yeah. And I'm not an expert in that field because I'm not allowed to talk about it. But basic, <laughs> basically, that you know, the, the head of MI6 is very keen to make sure that people don't necessarily associate them with James Bond and what he does. Obviously, they do a risky, dangerous job, but it is a lot of data crunching. It isn't necessarily as sexy as what it's portrayed to be, and they are very keen on getting their social media um, correct and right and so that people understand what's going on in their world. So I guess the NSA, those kind of shadowy organisations, shall we say, wouldn't necessarily scream yeah. about everything. Because it, it is about communication, it's about getting your message out there, it's about grabbing pe- people's attention, storytelling, and maybe those kind of things aren't necessarily associated with those those kind of businesses. But, yeah. but like you say, there's still an element that they would still leverage uh, the power of social media to do. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to be talking about um, a real-life case study that's been going on um, more more of as, as an experiment than anything else over the past three weeks and how successful that's been. But we'll talk about that shortly. Um, so branding. Um, before yeah. we start talking about the, the importance of using the likes of Twitter and Facebook and yeah. all these other tools, before you even start a social media strategy, what's the most important and probably the first thing you should do before you even start opening up an account? Yeah. Well, I think, I think this is it. So I think a lot of, I think a lot of people go in... And say right, I need to post or hear hear people hear advice from people that say I need to post three times a day on Twitter. I need to upload two photos. I need to have, you know, this kind of stage shot. And I think they're kind of missing the point. I think you have to go right back to the beginning and start with what's the brand of your business, what's the vision for where you want to take the business, what you want to be known as in the eye of your consumer uh, or your customer, 
um, you know, what's your vision, what are your values, what do you stand for, um, what type of, you know, what type of customers do you want to attract and what actual type of customers don't you want to attract? You know, we all think, oh God, customers, you just want more of them, but actually you don't, you want to be able to pick and choose customers that are aligned with your, your vision, your values. So I think the branding element has to start at a business level. So how are we branding our business? How do we want to be perceived? And it can then flow down into, in fact, into every area of your business of which one part might be marketing and sales, of which a subset is then social media strategy. And that's when you then get down to, okay, well, if my brand is, you know, fitness is a really, it's just a really easy example to use. If my brand is fitness, then maybe I need to be showing pictures of people achieving and you, you always see it with the likes of you know Joe Wicks, the body coach, and he's posting a lot of stuff of people that are on his program that are making great improvements. He's posting constantly about what he's doing himself. And that's totally aligned to his to his brand, but he started with what's his brand and then he's moving down into okay, aligning a social media strategy with that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's building trust with his 100%. future customers. Yeah. Because if they're not aware of what you're doing, um, what makes you any different from Tom, Dick and Harry out there who are already um, fitness professionals? Yeah. I was um, talking to an agent earlier today and um, it's not necessarily appealing to today's customers in the sense that, yes, they already know who you are and what you do. You're, you're planting the seeds for tomorrow's customers because when they're ready to buy or sell a house, they need to be aware of who you are and what you do, and whether you're trustworthy. Yeah. Otherwise, like, isn't there like a, there's like various levels, it's like no, was it no like, trust, buy or something? And there's, something like that, yeah. there's, there's gotta be so a certain amount of touch points that firstly someone's gotta know about you to be able to kind of get to know you, they've gotta know of you to then get to a point where they actually trust you and like you, and then they'll buy from you. You can't, you can't go straight from not being known at all to then being fully trusted and, and yeah. in a position to be able to sell something or work with someone. And, and with these platforms, they are inexpensive platforms. I mean, the, the cost of the traditional uh, marketing, so um, TV, radio, and newspaper, it would cost you a lot of money and it would sink and it would be very difficult yeah. to measure and monitor your performance. You know, what's the conversion rate? Well, it's very difficult to know unless you ask the customer at the point of sale, but even then they probably won't remember, to be fair. So with the likes of digital channels such as Twitter, and Facebook, etc., etc., you do have a very good way of monitoring and measuring the um, successful or not so successful campaign that you put out there. And that's very important, monitoring and measuring these campaigns. Otherwise, you're just chucking money yeah, and it's absolutely. just you're not getting anything back from it. And also, it allows you to tweak your campaigns. Has, you know, perhaps we could do it in a slightly better way. But I think you need to touch customers at least, not literally, um, <laughs> that's a different type of business. Well, depends on type of business. Yeah, right? do, yeah, if you're a masseuse. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. Need to touch your customers. Um, or should we stop there? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you need to be um, contacting, touching your customers at least seven times before they will, you know, actually start stop yeah. and listen and pay attention to what you are. Um, it's just human psychology. It's, it's, familiarity yeah. I know this brand so so, does, so building that familiarity there's an element of consistency and message there as well and I think that's probably ties back to actually ha knowing what your message is up front because you could say you've got a social media strategy that dictates that you're going to post this many times on this many platforms with these type of this type of content but actually if every diff every post has a has a different underlying branding or message it's going to get very confusing for the for the consumer and absolutely. you probably wouldn't build that trust as quickly if at all yeah absolutely like you said you need a clear vision everyone needs to know and it needs to stem from the top downwards so everyone is on board everyone knows the vision everyone knows the message and your social media person in your company whoever looks after it would have to very closely align their posts and their tweets etc with the vision, the brand, what message, what campaign are we trying to put across to the public? Because if you start firing off left, right and center, and it could be off message, you, what, what is the end user gonna think about this? They're gonna think, well, they're not consistent in their branding. We don't really understand what they're saying. You need to be consistent, and that stems from the top, and you need a clear vision. And do you think there's a element, there's an element of 
desperation when you're starting out and wanting to appeal to everyone that actually you think you might take custom from anywhere and that probably turns people off because you are being a bit too like broad brush approach to it you need to be you need to have your niche you need to have mm. your um, target audience you can't be appealing to everyone or you'll please no one yeah and that's a very simple way of looking at it so for example um, there are certain exclusive watches I won't mention any of their names but for example a, a top tier watch brand they're not necessarily going to be appeal, um, appealing to um, your average Joe on the street because yeah. they don't have a quarter of a million or a million dollars to spend on a watch so their social media campaign will be very focused it will be looking at people with, who are naturally affluent in their circles and you can target these things on Facebook because it's amazing the amount of data that Facebook has on us uh, worryingly or mm -hmm. as an opportunity that's another discussion so yeah they will be targeting their thing that, that they're not going to be looking at people who are driving a Ford or a Vauxhall they're going to be looking at people who are driving at a Bentley and Ferrari etc etc so you have all these different tiers that you can very precisely target your ad so it can be a very very useful tool yeah yeah absolutely and I think yeah like you say if you you need to target and niche and I think the when you start out it's hard to niche because you're niching absolutely restricts your customer your customer base and when you're just starting out you think actually I don't want to limit it at all I want to be you know I want to I want someone who's a female who's you know 16 to, to buy my product as much as I want a male 80 year old you know but actually uh, depending on what it is that's not not n n rarely going to be the case and that also ties in with what market research is the business doing at the moment yeah. you know, do you really know your customer base because if you do then you will target those yeah. things but you also need to keep an eye on the fact that as you have a specific window of age so for example 30 to 40 for this particular product yeah as the 30 your olds become 40 and move on you need to be targeting the mid 20s so that they're ready and it could take several years before they hit that optimal window shall we say and they know about you and they know but they it's know, they know before they have a baby that mother care is where they go to exactly. buy their prams yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I always find it ironic so just as an aside the, the supercars the porsches the ferraris everyone wants to drive them when they're 16 and they're in their 20s and yet they can only afford it when they're in their 50s yeah. 60s if they can ever afford but then you look a bit sad yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you look like so, you're trying too hard yeah you're trying yeah. too hard so yeah. i always find that very yeah, ironic that yeah. and quite That's funny nice. um so i'm going to share with the listeners now mo about yeah. a couple of case studies so one was um, a, a long-standing one so this is the professional investment group um pig as we all know it and that is my experience with Facebook and yeah. groups and pages, et cetera, et cetera. And then I want to talk about something that, which started off as an experiment about three weeks ago when I was on my honeymoon um, about my other passion, that's Star Trek. So the first thing I want to talk about is Pig. And I started that uh, four years ago this month. And it started in my living room with seven people. And now we have over 600 members across Devon and Cornwall expanding into the rest of the country. And... I wouldn't have been able to achieve those numbers and, and have done so well and given so much content and, be, and become friends with some great people without the power of Facebook. Yeah. So that sometimes there is a stigma about Facebook and perhaps it won't necessarily apply to every business, but I really recommend looking at the power of Facebook groups, especially closed groups because you add an element of exclusivity to it. So I have um, created free... So let's, let's just pause Go there on. for the listeners. So a closed group, is this, uh, is it a secret group? Is it invite only? Can people search it on Facebook and ask to be invited or do they need to be referred by someone? Okay. Just... So to answer your question, you need to apply to get in. Yeah. And all that is, is you click a button. <laughs> Can I please come into your group? There's nothing too tedious about it. But there are three different tiers. So one's an open group. Yeah. So for example, that may be good for um, the likes of Virgin. If they have Virgin Media problems, um, you may have a page or a group or a Twitter channel where people can just vent their anger or fury at you. And you need a nice open group for that. A closed group for, um, is something where you want people to join, but you want to just perhaps filter them on the way in, otherwise you could be spammed, etc., etc., um, or it may not be relevant to them. Or maybe competitors get can get in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's nothing to hide, no. but you may want to keep it um, yeah. fairly exclusive. And then the other option is to have a secret group, and that is purely for your, you know, your 
um, surprise birthday parties, for mm. example, you don't want other people knowing about so it. So you can't search a secret group no, through you, the search. No, you can, yeah. you can search for a closed and open group, but you can't, it has to be purely an invite only for a secret group. Yeah. So I created a closed group for Pig many, many years ago, and I invited in my friends, and we started talking about property and investing and you know, making money. And then they started inviting their friends and then word of mouth, and organically, it's grown phenomenally well really really well over 600 members now um, over the past year or so and it's just become this great thing where people can just share ideas if they need help they can say i need help who can who knows a good plumber yeah so it's a good networking tool it's a good knowledge sharing tool and it's a good way for me to share when the next event is or if there's special offers etc etc for for members so it works really well but one key component that a lot of people uh, may not necessarily understand with with Facebook and working these things is that you have to pay it forward mm. first. Don't expect to go in and say, right, I'm selling this product, buy it now, I've yeah. created a group, yeah. do it, I'm legit now because I'm on Facebook. It doesn't work that way. People don't like you. They think you're too pushy, you're too salesy. You need to give content free first without any expectation of a sale because otherwise people will just be turned off you. And there's almost this psychological, um, uh, I'm struggling for the word here. Barrier. Where, Obligation, not obligation, but something along those lines where basically if you give out 90% and you ask, yeah, perhaps you want to attend my event and it's going to cost you 15 or 20 So you're basically pounds. guilt tripping them into it. I, I, hate, I hate to use that term because it, it is you know, like I know that what you mean. Though. Because yeah. people aren't stupid. Yeah. They're not going to part with their money unless they can see real value or real content. And that's another key important thing. It has to be relevant. It has to be good. And you and chuck in your own personality. You know, don't yeah. become a clone of someone else. Yeah. Be yourself, yeah. because one thing that I've seen um, with this events industry is that other people tend to copy you and clone you, and that's perfectly fine. There's enough room for everyone in the yeah. in the playground, but unless you really want to do it and it's a burning desire, and you, you know you really want to make a difference in this world, I find watching them after three four months they'll just evaporate mm. because they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. They're doing because I want money. I want money. Yeah. I want to make lots out of this group. It doesn't work that yeah. way. You have to pay it forward first. Yeah. So and it takes and it takes time, like you say, and you have to be consistent with your message. And it comes back to the branding, and you know your brand, and that's why what you've built has been really, really successful as yeah. well. Um, and just yeah, and just banging the drum of, of consistency and content, giving out good content, and then saying, like you say, well, there's an event, um, come along. Yeah, we we don't have anything to sell at the event. Yeah. It's just more content, more networking, and it's great that way. So the. So Facebook has been a phenomenal tool. So just while we're on Facebook, there was one one thing I want to add, which has been um, targeting av targeted advertising mm -hmm. on Facebook, and that's really where we've had uh, probably the biggest success with with the Facebook ads that we've run. So we've got a uh, property management a part of our business is property management, and actually for student lets for rooms, so student rooms um, to rent, we find that posting pictures and uh, ads for rooms that are coming available for next academic year has been fantastic through Facebook. You get you get really good targeting. You can say, I want to um, target people between the ages of 18 and 19 or um, sorry, the lower end of like 18, 19 up to 24, 25 or whatever you can you can choose. Located in Plymouth, uh, where, we're, where we're recording this and interests are the University of Plymouth or the Students' Union or, or whatever you want to target. And actually, you get a really good amount of virality as well. And if you've got some good content, which in our case is um, some really great pictures, we have professional photography done of the rooms, you get a lot of people sharing it, you get a little bit, a lot of people commenting, people tagging their friends, and it goes mad. And obviously, you do have to put a bit of money behind it, but that just gets the ball rolling. It's almost like the snowball, you know, you have to start it off, and then people are sharing it, people are commenting on saying things like, I wish our rooms were like this when I was at university. And it's so easy for someone these days to just tag their friend in. And as soon as they do that, all their friends see it and then they comment on it. And within days, you filled a room for the next academic year. And I, I just love that, you know, the, the leverage of that yeah. vir virality. And because people share so much with Facebook, it's very easy to target your yeah. precise audience. Yeah, exactly. Um, and sometimes you may want to stray on the edges of it just to see whether you pick up new customers and sometimes it works. So it's a very good testing tool and you can save these preferences so you don't have to go through every option every yeah. time so it saves you a lot of time. At the same time, we've done campaigns where we've just, you, it's very easy to waste money. You can, you know, if you don't get it right, 
is that if you don't do split testing and you don't measure um, a couple of different variables on what you're doing and measure the output of it, it's very, very easy to just you know click a button, boost post, or do a new advert, and, and it just goes. So yeah. So know your market. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and just work on the the reporting tools that they give you. Yeah, make absolutely. Sure what, what 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 did work? How can you refine it further? And a lot of it will be. Yeah, you know, trial and error to begin it with. Really is, but I think that's I think all marketing is like that. Yeah, I yeah. really do. Like, it's not a precise science. No, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Um, and second thing I want to talk about is Twitter. Yeah. And uh, the power of Twitter. So, for those of you at home who know what a funnel is, great. But for those of you who don't know what a funnel is, a funnel is basically where you, it's wider at the top, where you try and um, encourage people, a lot of people, to go down through your various levels in your funnel, and then hopefully at the end of it hopefully make some kind of money, um, promotion, yeah. build your brand, whatever the end so, goal so is. it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier about people wanting, having to know about you first before they can then trust, yeah. like you, and then trust you, and then maybe buy from you or do a transaction. And the point of the funnel is that you lose a few people at each step in that. So actually, to be able to sell or work with or, or whatever, five people, maybe you need to have a thousand people aware of you. So the top of the funnel is a lot wider and the bottom is narrow. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like, I, I see it like buying a house. You view a hundred, you make an offer on 10, you buy one. Yeah. It's that kind of That's ratio. Funnel, yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to talk about Twitter yeah. and how it's a really good funnel um, for what I'm doing with my JustStarTrek.com channel. So this started second, as... Second plug. Yeah, second cheeky plug. <laughs> um, so this started three weeks ago when I was on honeymoon as an experiment more than anything, because I'm very passionate about it, and I find that helps when you're trying to do any of these um, things, whether it's social media or whatever else, building a brand, in the fact that you have to love what you're talking about, or Absolutely. you have to be knowledgeable of what you're talking about, because six months in, 12 months in, when you're bored, and you've had a really shitty week, um, you don't necessarily feel like doing it, but because it's in you, it's within your heart, it's not a chore to do it, shall we say. Yeah. So I started it three weeks ago, with the aim of just connecting with other people on Twitter and um, talking about Star Trek really because I love it and so do they. Yeah. So it's a great channel for us to use. And because I was putting out loads and loads of content out there, you know, my, I've got loads of photos of me in uniform doing various bits and bobs, some funny, some not so funny I'm sure. And one of the posts got picked up by CBS Studios, oh, wow. um, the people that make the Star Trek show yeah. and it was retweeted. And I think it got nearly 30,000 impressions so wow. in the period of a couple of weeks it had really just spread out like wildfire across it I, I, I know that's not major numbers in the what big was it things. what was the picture so it was a picture of me at a convention dressed as Captain Kirk and I was standing next to a Borg and I, it was an ironic quote saying resistance um, isn't always futile um, just be brave and there's a picture of me with my fingers by my mouth <laughs> looking terrified so um, but like I said you if you create the content, if yeah. you give out more content than what you consume, people respect that mm -hmm. and they like it. And over the period of um, three weeks now, I've got nearly 800 followers. I know these aren't mega numbers, but everything starts mm -hmm. somewhere. And yeah. I'm really pleased. And what I'm using Twitter for is, first of all, to have open up a dialogue with the fans. And I've made some actually some really good friends from it. Yeah. But what I'd like them to do is um, connect to the YouTube channel. I've started where yeah. I'm reviewing Star Trek ships, episodes, etc., etc., yeah. and that has grown really, really well. And I want to build a little community there so we can all discuss Star Trek. Who knows where it may lead? It may lead to sponsorships, may lead to interviewing actors, maybe even a film part. You know, there's, there's always a dream. <laughs> um, but it's which just, which character would you play? Um, I I'd probably play the um, tall, dark, handsome, exotic alien. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of special effects involved with that one, that's for sure. <laughs> Makeup department on overtime on there. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that these channels, ignoring the, the sci-fi element, yeah, you it's can powerful. It's a very powerful tool. If you get the right message across with enough energy, enthusiasm, quirkiness, funniness, or whatever uh, way you want to present yourself, you can attract a very good, strong audience. And you want to build a tribe. Because ultimately, yeah. it's that tribe that is going to trust you, like you, and when they think about um, Star Trek or estate agent, or whatever it may yeah. be, student rooms, mm -hmm. for example, they'll think, right, okay, yes, this guy, Angloss, this guy, Mo, they, I remember them talking about yeah. it. We'll go to them yeah. first, as opposed to 
other competitors. And the key is, is that sometimes your competitors may be having a better social media strategy and may entice your customers away from you, even though they may not be half as good as what your business is, but because their social media presence is a lot better than yours, they go to you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and it's, it, it is, it's ridiculously powerful and, and, and I love it. And, and I think you're being quite modest with the numbers. I think to have 30,000 impressions on, on something like that on, you know, in the first few days when you launched it is, is, is amazing. So yeah, yeah that's really cool. It's, it's a great thing. And um, any business that isn't necessarily thinking about social media, I, I strongly recommend you, you speak with an expert um, about or possibly employing someone in your business about it getting your social media strategy up and running as soon as possible. Definitely, definitely. I think I th when you start, you don't necessarily have to know where it's going to go, I th particularly when it's something that you're passionate about, which you're obviously very passionate about the, the Star Trek stuff. And you don't, you don't have to think of it initially as how am I going to make money out of this, how am I going to monetize it, and, I, and the, the benefit of that is that you that really comes out in what you're doing yeah. and you're not trying to think about how you're going to cash in on it straight away there is a, passion comes across. It, it's quite difficult, like you said, with marketing. It's very difficult to put a, a dollar value to how much you're spending because... What's getting, the ROI? Yeah, yeah, getting, yeah, your, yeah. You, getting the brand out, getting your name out, getting the reputation, getting the vision and what you do out there is probably a very difficult thing to measure because once you're in people's minds, it takes a long time to do it and you will have to spend some money to, to buy some headspace. But like I said earlier, it's about the future customers getting your That's message it. out, making sure they're prepped and ready. When they hit that correct window, they're ready to buy from you and not your competitor. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Brilliant. All right, Mo. So, yeah, we've talked about understanding the value of social media. Yep. And before you rush out and start your social media strategy, making sure that your vision, your values are correctly written down and clear for everyone. Otherwise, you'll just go off half cocked and, and no one wants to do that. And we've also discussed about Facebook, um, the value of targeted ads, groups, exclusivity, yeah. and Twitter. So hopefully that's been of use to, to listeners at home. Please leave your comments. Please subscribe. It doesn't cost a lot um, to do that. And we will speak to you soon. Cool. Thank you. Cheers, guys. You've been listening to Pig Pods. Click subscribe for more incredible content. More details can be found at www.pig.network.